Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm your host, Duke Oishi. And I'm your co-host, Nicole Hori. In our show this time, we'll cover the Don't Be Afraid of Sending Your Kid to China program we presented at the Plaza Club. The program examined the experiences of Hawaii people living and working in the People's Republic of China. We wanted to hear and discuss their personal stories of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the People's Republic. More and more, the media reminds us that China is a place of corruption and abuse, of secret police, show trials, and stifled protests, with incursions into privacy, though they don't have a monopoly on that, and one with an imperfect adherence to the rule of law. It's depicted as a place that isn't particularly concerned with human rights, and one that allows the infringement of our intellectual property. The media also reminds us that China is a place that's building up its military capability, threatens its neighbors, wrecks havoc on the environment, permits the contamination of food, aggressively and sometimes unfairly competes with our industry and buys up huge amounts of strategic land and businesses in the U.S. Wow, how concerned should we be about these things? How do they affect Hawaii people living and working in China? Is a Western style and standard of life possible? Can you feel safe and healthy on the streets, breathing the air, drinking the water, and eating in the restaurants? Can you, should you, go there? Get a job and live, work, learn, play, and travel around the country? Is it worth the trouble, or do the costs and risks and inconveniences outweigh the benefits of being there? Why wouldn't we just stay home or go to other places in Asia instead? So in this program, we wanted to find out about life on the ground in China for your kid, your CEO, or maybe you. Our moderator was Larry Foster, former dean of the William S. Richardson School of Law at UH Manoa. He has lived in China with his wife, Brenda, who is also in the program. He has taught and practiced law in China, and he speaks, reads, and writes Mandarin. I've been, been going to Asia, to China, um, since the 1960s in, in, different, in different roles, first as a student and more recently to, uh, to work. Uh, uh, so, I, so I have some perspective in, in, in a variety of different uh, roles out there. Uh, uh, Jay mentioned the, the phrase, go west, young man, uh, from, from uh, those of you that, were, that read the newspapers in the 1850s, um, that, 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 that was a, a phrase that uh, was it Horace Greeley uh, came up with. Anyway, uh, his idea was to encourage young people in Back in the day, we only spoke about men. Now, nowadays, we speak about men and women. But he said, "Go, go west, young man." That's where the opportunity was. Uh, I think uh, one of the recurring themes you're going to hear today is China represents opportunity for those of us in Hawaii: uh, job opportunities and certainly educational opportunities. So I think all of us would uh, uh, encourage you to uh, to uh, go out to China. Uh, uh, I went out on, the, on this most recent trip as what we call a trailing spouse. Uh, my wife had a job there, so I was sort of going along with her. Uh, for the first couple of years, uh, I worked as a lawyer in a uh, Chinese law firm, uh, international Chinese law firm. Had about six or seven hundred lawyers around the country and, and uh, a couple of offices uh, uh, um, we had in the U.S., in Tokyo, Hong Kong. Uh, I worked there until I could no longer get a work permit. We're going to talk about visas and work permits. I was too old to get a work permit. Mandatory retirement age for men is 60, 60, and for women it is 55. Then we heard from our panelists. The first was Derek Brow, a tennis star who earned a graduate law degree in China, then came back to start law school in Hawaii. 
A little over a month ago, I just graduated from law school in China and moved back to Hawaii. In 2011, I enrolled in the Renmin University of China School of Law and enrolled in their LLM master's program in Chinese civil and commercial law. Now, I, sorry, I, just, I did this for uh, two reasons. I was trying to achieve two objectives at the same time. The first is I wanted to keep building on my Chinese language skills, and there's no real better way to do that than moving to the country where the language originated and learning it there. And the second reason I did it was to really understand uh, the Chinese legal system and how much it's changed over time and how much it's reformed and how society has changed with it. I want to go into further detail of those two objectives because I was born and raised in Hong Kong, but when I was younger, I didn't really have a deep appreciation for the language that I do now. When I left Hong Kong to come to the United States, little by little I lost my language skills, unfortunately, and even when I was studying Chinese and taking courses at UH Manoa, it wasn't really improving at the speed that I wanted it to improve. And anybody here who's lived in China um, can, can tell you that when you have to use it on a daily basis, you, you'll be amazed at how fast your language skills can improve there. Now for the second objective, and this relates actually to my mother's experiences, um, she lived in Beijing many years ago and we keep talking about how much it's changed. Back when she was there, there was very little infrastructure in terms of subway systems and the buildings look different and it just it was not a very comfortable and easy place to live if you were, especially if you were a foreigner. And it made me realize how much society has changed, how the economy has sped up, uh, industries keep expanding in all different areas. Then came Larry Foster's wife, Brenda Foster. Brenda was a longtime president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai, with quite a story to tell. I'm going to begin by answering your question. Uh, should students and CEOs or other business people go to China? The answer is yes. What is going to be my one word when I leave uh, here? Trade-offs. Okay, I like to talk about, when we talk about China, we have to ask ourselves, which China are we talking about? There's several different Chinas. There's the national government China, uh, there is the business community, there's the student community, there's the everyday people on the street. And they all look at China differently and you will relate to each and every one of them differently. Uh, why should one go to China? It's dynamic. It's challenging. Uh, there is absolutely no place like it in the world to be at the heart and center of everything that seems to be taking place. It's just not about the U.S. We have everybody there from around the world. The United States' biggest competitors there, quite frankly, are from Europe. Uh, and it is really phenomenal to be able to meet with colleagues from around the world to solve challenging problems that everybody is facing in China. Should you go? Sure, but not without due diligence. So that's two words, but I want you to remember due diligence. I usually tell the business community, I have my six Ds before you should come to China. Due diligence, due diligence, and more due diligence. You also need to manage your expectations. Um, China's not for everybody. After that, we heard from Russell Liu, a Hawaii lawyer who for the past 10 years has practiced in Beijing. He flew in for Beijing for the program. I've been in China for 10 years now. Um, I've been in different, from different perspectives. I've been a student. I've been a lawyer. I'm an assistant vice dean and uh, assistant dean at law school. So I've seen a very different parts of society in China. And I'm seeing something interesting that's happening here in Hawaii that really encourages me. And I'm seeing that there are more CEOs that are actually going to China. I've had three, four meetings the last month here and in China from some good companies that are planning to go to China. And also I've, I've had three or four phone calls from parents whose kids are going to go to China to teach. And they're all asking me, is this China is safe? And so I've, I'm seeing a lot of interest. So I think we've come to a time where actually Things are going to happen in Hawaii. From the China perspective, uh, I represent clients that have a lot of money, and they're looking to take money outside, invest in places all over the U.S. The U.S. is the last market. They've been running around. I've been doing things in Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, a um, lot of acquisitions of, of, of companies. and they're, they're getting their money out there. And their big thing in China right now is the government has a big push called the going out policy. They've had this policy since 2002, but right now, it's more than ever because the leader is Xi Jinping. And his 
claim to his legacy that he wants to end up, after 10 years, being known as the bookend to Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping said, I want you guys to invest into China. So he made it very lucrative for foreign businesses to come in China. Now he's encouraging the state-owned enterprises, the very large companies, to go outside and invest. The next speaker was Judge Shackley Raffetto, who retired as the chief judge of the Second Circuit in Maui and found a new legal avocation in China. Well, I'm Shackley Raffetto. Uh, retired a year ago as the chief judge for the Second Circuit over in Maui. Um, in terms of experience in China, I visited uh, my first time in 1984 on the way back from some military duty. I, I went on a 10-day tour in southern China. And at that time, for any of those who have been there at, around that time, you'll know that there was very little trace of Western culture. I think I saw a Coca-Cola bottle, and that was about it. Everyone was wearing Mao jackets, and uh, there were no cars, and everyone was riding bicycles. About 20 years later, I happened to pass through Beijing, and I was absolutely astonished by the difference. And any of you who've been there can appreciate that. It's huge traffic jams in Beijing, modern, amazing modern buildings everywhere. Um, my experience is probably the least of all of your speakers today, but I, I know any of you who've been there will agree that going to China is an intense experience. It's a very, very interesting and different place. Um, I began going in more recent years to serve as a volunteer judge for something called the Jessup International Law Moot Court Competition, which is an international moot court competition, as the name implies. Uh, about 90 countries participate, and they have the final in Washington, D.C. every year. Uh, presently, the, uh, in China, the China Rounds uh, have about 50 to 55 uh, law schools participating in the program out of, I understand, seven, 600 law schools in China. Finally, we heard from Nikki Shishido, a young woman who lived in China working for DBED, the State Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. I used to work for DBED, which is the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism in Beijing. How many of you knew that we had a DBED office overseas in Beijing? Oh, okay, quite a number of you. Oh, that's good, because I was working there for about four years and working with the executive director, Mr. Bo Wu. And while I was there, I was helping to promote educational opportunities in Hawaii. So um, there's a conglomerate called Study Hawaii. And they'd come out to China, and um, we do some road tours around through different cities. And we try to promote the Hawaii educational opportunities because when I was doing that, I guess back in 06 to 2010, during these road shows, a lot of the Chinese parents would come to my table and they'd laugh. You know, they'd say, no, you can't study in Hawaii. You know, you're just going to go there and end up playing all the time. And they didn't even think that we had universities here. So, um, you know, the Asian work regiment for students is a lot it's a lot different than what you can compare to in America. There's a lot more pressure, and especially in China. Um, so they take, you know, they take things a, a bit more seriously there. But I did, um, you know, meet a lot of good parents and students that were interested in Hawaii, and I think, you know, a number of them that I know have sent their kids here as well. And that's, um, you know, as Jay was mentioning, there's been a, waves and waves of Chinese students coming to the USA, but not so many going from the U.S. to China. Our convener, Bill Spencer, then offered his customary dispensation, where he put all the special words of the day from all the panelists into a single sentence. So my sentence is, you should go to China because it's dynamic, intense, humbling, and challenging. But there are trade-offs. So do your due diligence, learn the culture and the language, don't breathe the air or eat the food, <laughs> and be ready to compete with others from the rest of the world. So I hope that summarizes it for you. I, I am concerned that Hawaii is behind the eight ball on embracing the Chinese. This, I think this is our biggest challenge, both from a tourism standpoint, but also from the business and investment standpoint. After the program, we interviewed some of the people who were there to get their views of how it went and what they learned from it.
I really applaud Think Tech Hawaii uh, to be able to bring all of us together to be able to have a substantive discussion on issues that otherwise the people would never know about. I'm just seeing there is some buzz in the business community here. I've talked to some CEOs that actually are thinking of going to China and I've talked to some parents of uh, lawyers and business people who are sending the kids to China. It was nice to be able to share some of my experiences and also actually to hear the comments of the other panel members, you know, because my experience is narrow and by listening to the others, they gave me a lot of ideas. Well, I'm really excited to be here and really glad to see so many interested people with their own China stories. We have a lot of Chinese investors coming to Hawaii, so we want to be taking advantage of that in some degree. It was a really wonderfully broad representation of first-hand experience. It made me want to visit, but it also made me realize that I don't know nearly enough. I've been there, but it was about 30 years ago too, and everyone was riding bicycles, but now it's so dynamic. My husband has been to Shanghai and is, wants to get me there, so we're going. Maybe 10 years down the road, uh, more people would have gone to the small cities and the small towns because that's still where more Chinese live. I think this program is fascinating and I noticed I've been here twice for a couple different things and I don't see too many military people come and kind of take advantage of of the opportunities. I think it was great. I learned a lot about China that I didn't know. It sounds like we have a lot of challenges in order to get Chinese investment here. You know, our business community, our state have to get our act together if we want to have um, the same, this, the same types of opportunities as we had in the 80s with the Japanese. I enjoy everything that's done here. Yes, my son's okay. <laughs> you guys picked a good wide variety of panelists, uh, but we all had a common theme that absolutely go. And as I was saying just a minute ago, uh, go but eyes wide open. China is, they practice age discrimination with no buts, ifs, ands, or buts about it. Somebody on this panel should have mentioned what is the word for Hawaii in Chinese? Shawaii. My last semester there, I finally had some free time to travel, so I immediately got with my Chinese friends. We got together and found the best, most efficient, and cheapest routes to take the train all over China. And, you know, just try to learn as much as I could because I don't know when exactly I can go back. I would love to see the Hawaii entrepreneurs um, going to China you know, and doing well. And using Hong Kong as a platform to go into China, there are many ways to go to China, many routes. I'm trying to learn about China, and I'm kind of a don't know too much about it. And my being an academic, my normal approach would be to go get books and read things. But this, surprisingly to me, was much more effective than that. All in all, this was a program that gave us valuable insight into how China is evolving as a place to live and work, and what life is like for Hawaii people who take the time to go there. It's a great thing for Hawaii people to go and experience today's China, but it requires due diligence in the planning and close attention while you are there. But really, we shouldn't miss it for the world. China changes every day, and it changes the people who spend time there. Xie Xie, and thanks for watching our special segment on China. Don't be afraid to send your kid or CEO to China. Stories of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the People's Republic. ThinkTech will do more shows on China as we go forward, so stay tuned. And now let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech streams video and audio for all of its shows live on the internet from 2 to 5 p.m. every weekday afternoon. And we replay them all night long on Ustream.tv. Visit ThinkTechHawaii.com for our live stream and YouTube links. 
Raise your awareness on ThinkTech. On Thursday, September 26th, the Hawaii Venture Capital Association and ThinkTech will join with the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum to present a luncheon program at the Plaza Club entitled Solar in Hawaii. What does it look like for the long haul? The program will feature a blue ribbon panel from the solar industry. You can sign up for these programs on hvca.org. And now, here's Bill Spencer, president of the Hawaii Venture Capital Association, with this week's Spencation. I don't know what it is, Bill, but people seem to think that tuna collects all the, all the bad chemicals in the world. And now we have people saying that tuna or Fukushima they're collecting radiation. Uh, what's the story and is it true? Tuna and many other top-level predators uh, collect all sorts of toxins which naturally occur in the environment except for PCBs which uh, is one of our contributions to the environment. <laughs> but the Fukushima issue, as drear as it is and as frustrating as it is to watch unfold, uh, has really been inflated on social media, especially recently. Uh, you know, graphic pictures of radiation seeping into the ocean, polluting the whole Pacific. Uh, people are just getting carried away, and I think there needs to be some common sense. Uh, so, for example, let me try and give you some numbers here to put it in perspective. Um, over the last two years, about uh, 350 to 400 uh, tons of uh, water radioactive water has been seeping into the ocean. And a ton of water represents about a, uh, a cubic meter. Not much. Not much. And the Pacific Ocean is about 715 cubic kilometers in, in volume. Uh, so that and means... Thousands and thousands of meters <laughs> in a kilometer. Thousands and thousands. So, so basically the amount of radioactive water that's seeped into the ocean in the last two years is about one millionth of the total volume of the Pacific Ocean. And a couple of other interesting facts, uh, you know, the amount of, the most radioactivity found in the bluefin tuna off of uh, California and, and off of uh, Fukushima is about uh, three units per kilogram. Well, guess what? Bananas have three and a half units per kilogram. I mean, ordinary bananas, not ordinary bananas from bananas. Fukushima. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. ordinary bananas. Uh, potatoes and carrots have about three units. Beef has about three units. Radiation is all around us, and like I said, you'll you'll get as much radiation just flying from Hawaii to the mainland as you would by consuming 700 pounds of uh, of tuna, 700 <laughs> kilograms, 1,400 pounds. So calm down, everybody. I mean, it, it is a, it's a serious problem, um, but it's, it's not the end of the world. And I think one other thing with regards to toxin and tuna that people don't understand is, you know, tuna and swordfish, and they're predator fish. They eat fish that have eaten fish that have eaten fish all the way down the food chain. The actual food conversion of a wild-caught tuna is a hundred pounds of fish for every pound of growth. So if you add up all the fish that have been eaten by the time that tuna eats that fish for dinner, uh, it actually represents a lot of fish. Whereas farmed seafood, the ratio, the food conversion ratio is actually closer to four to one, wet to wet comparison. Mm -hmm. uh, so it turns out that Farmed seafood is the most efficient way to produce protein, even over wild. And people say, oh, I'd rather have wild fish despite the toxins that are concentrated in the flesh. The fact is, is a farmed fish is actually more efficient, uh, better for the environment than a wild fish. And you can control what you feed the fish Absolutely. in a farmed environment. Absolutely. You can test it. Make sure there's no mercury in that fish feed. Yeah. Make sure it's not radioactive. This is really important. You know, we're, we're involved in a whole generation of finding, of finding our relationship with the environment. And in some ways, we still have not yet found it. But these things will be revealed and hopefully, uh, you know, we'll understand better going forward. This is one of those pieces. It's true. And I, I think it also illustrates that, you know, the pervasiveness of, of social media, the, the notion that everybody can be a journalist and, and report uh, on things that are happening in the world, 
uh, still requires caution. You know, as my grandfather used to say, 50% of everything you read in the paper is false. The problem is figuring out which 50%. <laughs> And I'm wondering if the ratio has changed now with uh, social media. I think so. But it requires <laughs> us to keep on straightening this kind of stuff out, Bill. Absolutely. Thanks, Bill. You're welcome. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of ThinkTech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Hawaii Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric and Hawaii Electric Light on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle and Kokoi, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company, empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. Okay, Nicole, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week can't get enough of it, just like J.F. Idell does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. Definitely, Duke. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech on OC16, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be an underwriter, a sponsor, or a volunteer, and help us reach Hawaii. I'm Duke Oishi. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. Aloha everyone, and in Mandarin, Zaijin. I'm Nicole Hori. See you next time. Mm -hmm.